I'm Bob Beeman, and it is really an honor to be a part of the History Makers 20 at 2020. And I certainly uh, am excited to be a part of this wonderful group of great people who will be honored also. Hello, my name is Brenda Singletary. I'm an artist in downtown Adrian, Michigan. I'm at my art gallery, The Art Factory. My History Makers interview was January 16th through the 17th in 2007. Congratulations, History Makers, on your 20th anniversary. Hello, I'm Sam Morrison from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was interviewed by the History Makers on March the 7th, 2017. I wish to thank the History Makers for preserving the 20th century history of African Americans. Hi, I'm Alfreda Burke, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois, the Windy City. I was interviewed by History Makers in August of 2013. And we want to say happy anniversary to you, History Makers. We are enormously grateful for the work that you do to archive the, the information of African Americans in each area, arena, industry, and profession. Thank you for that. God bless you to see 20 plus more years. Hi, I'm Leonard Davis in New York City, and I want to say happy 20th anniversary to the History Makers. I was interviewed in 2007. I'm a New York City fashion designer. Congratulations to all of my other fellow uh, History Makers for their interviews. But more importantly, I want to say congratulations to Dr. Juliana Richardson. We were on our way from Atlanta to Columbus, Georgia. As we glided down the highway, I heard an ever slight murmur that turned into a choir of hushed voices. I was in the location of my kinfolk, and I swear to this day, they were cheering us on. They wanted for our success.
Telling American stories. Is celebrating our future. Telling American stories. Celebrating our future. Celebrating our future. How can we best use this early year of high school to prepare for college? And where we came from is where you are. Let's give a big shout out to the class of 2016. I expect everyone in red shirts to walk across the stage. Of everything we are and do and will be. On your blue paper, I want you to tell me how do we celebrate history makers? Good evening. I'm pleased to be back here again tonight. Let me tell you about the story we're gonna hear tonight. From philanthropist to entertainer to sports mogul, she has made her mark. Let's listen, Sheila Johnson.
Hello, I am Representative Johnny Shaw from Bolivar, Tennessee. I was interviewed by the History Makers in 2014. Actually, it was April the 23rd, 2014. I am so proud to share this moment with the rest of all of the History Makers across this country. It is a privilege for me to say congratulations to all of you. And remember, God can't get you through it until he gets you to it. Hello, my name is Lottie Shackle Ford, and I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. I was interviewed by the History Makers on March 14, 2018. I'm so excited about being a part of this 20 year anniversary celebration of History Makers. I wholeheartedly support the History Makers, and I encourage you to support the History Makers. My name is Nezra the First. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I was interviewed by the History Makers on December 21st, 2004. And I'm so happy to be a part of the 20th year anniversary celebration. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, CEO of the African American Film Critics Association and a member of History Makers class of 2018. It's so cool to be part of a community that positively shapes and uplifts our people. Congratulations, history makers, on 20 great years. May your work live forever. Hello, I'm Mary Schmidt Campbell. And in 2002, history makers interviewed me in New York City. Now, as the 10th president of Spelman College, I am so proud to be one of the 3,000 interviews that History Makers has conducted in the past 20 years. Happy anniversary, History Makers, and may you have another 20 years of Black Lives Matter when it comes to telling the stories that contribute to our history, our country, and our culture. Hello, I'm James Avery. Welcome to the History Makers Talking Truth, a series featuring inspirational stories and words of wisdom from famous African Americans. What you're about to hear are extraordinary stories from members of our community who've made it despite all odds. These are true stories about faith, faith in God, a divine presence, and faith in ourselves. We hope these stories will inspire you to go after your dreams, to reach your highest goals, and to have faith no matter what. God gives us what we need to understand that God is alive inside of us. God gives us the experiences we need to come home, to find our way home. My life had fallen apart. I was working at Essence, making that $500 a month. My marriage had fallen apart. It was the low point. I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent, how I was going to feed my daughter Shauna. I didn't know how I was going to make it through the night. I was so anxious that the anxiety turned into a physical pain. I was having difficulty breathing all week, and by the time Sunday rolled around, I thought I was having a heart attack. I called my husband to come to my house that Sunday morning to pick up my daughter and take me to the hospital. And I sat in the emergency room, as people do when they don't have money to go to a private physician. I was examined. The doctor told me I wasn't having a heart attack, but an anxiety attack, and that I needed to slow down. And I remember saying, how can I slow down when the earth is moving beneath my feet? So I left the hospital, and I started walking up Broadway, and I looked up. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I saw a marquee 
outside that red United Palace. Church service, 3 p.m. A force pulled me into that church. I sat in the back of that church and I heard a sermon preached by a Reverend Alfred Miller. But it changed my life. He said that with your mind you control your world and that anything you believe about yourself is true. He said God is not far away from you. God is within you. God is alive in you. He said it again and again. God is alive in you. I had passed that church many a Sunday, had driven past. If I hadn't had the physical challenge, I wouldn't have been on that side of town. I would have passed that church as I had many a Sunday. So all of those things had to be in place, I came to realize, in order for me to hear that message. I gathered up all the pamphlets in that church, and I walked home that day. And as I was walking across, I guess, the McCombs Dam Bridge that leads from Harlem to the Bronx, I just kept saying what the minister said, God is alive in me. But I said it with a question mark at the end, God is alive in me? I'm going to discipline my mind to behave as though that is true because I have nothing to lose. I started to count my blessings. Okay, I don't have money. I, that's all I was focused on, what I didn't have. And that sermon helped me to look at what I did have. Oh, I was healthy, and my daughter was healthy, and I did have a roof, and I did have a job. You know, and I could use my talents and skills to do something else. And I asked the divinity, what should I do? I asked the inner core of me, teach. Go down to Ophelia DeVore's modeling school and teach the models how to apply makeup and fix their hair. Apply for the job and got it. My attitude changed. The next thing I knew, Marsha Gillespie was asking me to become the fashion editor. Our lives began to change. I've always come back to that message. I come back to it every day. It's the truth that I'm still trying to understand and live. God is alive in me. God is alive in us. There is nothing to fear. Believe in something that you can't see. The peace that you can see is more powerful than anything in the physical world. And that's what I've dedicated my life to trying to understand and to articulating to our people. Susan Taylor was eventually promoted to editor-in-chief at Essence Magazine. While holding that position, she increased readership to millions and inspired women worldwide through her monthly column, In the Spirit. Today, she continues to inspire and encourage others through her leadership at Essence Communications, her books, public speaking engagements, and charity work. I want to be remembered as a person who didn't waste her time here and just used whatever the gifts are that God has given me to make life better for people who are struggling needlessly along the margins. That's the legacy that I'm, that I'm leaving. That's what I'm working toward. I didn't come from a negative family. Uh, if a white kid called me the N-word, I would say to my grandfather what they'd call me, and he would say, Ann, is that your name? And that was the end of it. Uh, sometimes he would say, isn't it sad that that kid will never know what a wonderful, bright person you are? And then he'd start on another conversation. I don't deal in negatives today. I really don't worry about what people say about me or the criticism. I could care less. I am on this earth to be all that I can be. My prayer here every morning all the way to this school is God help me to fulfill the destiny, the place that you meant for me to be. Help me to do the things that you put me on this earth to do. I believe we were all sent here to do certain things. I think we don't do them because we follow our own wheels. I told the kids, God's trying to talk to us and show us success, but we're so busy with the TV and the facts and the this and the that, so God can never catch you home. You know, he can never get your attention. Marva Collins' core belief in God and her positive attitude has served her well. As one of America's most famous educators, Collins began working in the Chicago school system, setting high academic standards for poor, primarily black inner city students. Her results attracted national attention. In 1975, she started what is now called the Marva Collins Preparatory School. She continues to work as an educator and advocate for children. I live 
by a verse from Victor Hugo that I repeat constantly, give me patience for the small things of life. Give me courage for the great troubles of life. Help me to do my work and go to sleep knowing that God is awake. My challenge is a child that no one believes can succeed, that no one wants to be bothered with. They get on your last nerve. You have to go out and say a prayer sometimes because you want to choke them real slowly, but it's momentary because I come right back again. I'll say to a child in my moment of first, I don't care what you do, just do whatever you'd like. And then five minutes later, I say, I changed my mind. You're gonna learn or you're gonna die and I take your choice. But it's a passion for me to see people succeed. It's a real, to share that passion with other people. You know, that you really can achieve whatever you'd like to achieve. I was born on a Sunday, June 7th, that Sunday, 1931. So on the 10th, my father walked me into the, to the church in the, in the little chapel, Hunts Chapel. And he offered me up to God and gave me a name. He said I would always be blessed because he had given me to God. I can remember the paternal grandmother, uh, Grandma Han as we call her. Um, my father took me fishing with him one day up in the mountains on the broad river and he stopped by the house where she was living and she looked at me and she moved, turned my hands over and looked at them. And she turned to my father and she said, this boy is not gonna be a farmer, send him to school. She says, he does not have the hands of a farmer. And so I guess my father kind of rallied in that concept because where, whereas my sisters would stay at home, chop the cotton, pick the cotton, he would send me to school. That decision made all the difference in the world. After graduating from high school in the mountains of North Carolina, David Driscoll went to Howard University. I go to Howard, present myself, and say, I'm here to go to college. And they looked at me like I came from Mars, and they said, you don't just come to college, you make an application. I said, well, I'm here, give me one. And I had my report card, and I'm salutatorian, and like, how dare you not admit me? And they said, well, school has been going on for three weeks. You can't just come to college like that. And uh, I worried those people sick. I went up there every day. And uh, they finally just let me sit in on the classes. And I wrote home, and said, I'm in college now. David Driscoll was officially enrolled that January. Well, I really wasn't well prepared, but I was able to hang in there. I didn't write well. I hadn't had all the math I should have. And there was a gentleman who took me, one of the counselors, who took me under his wings, a Dr. Lawrence, I will never forget. And he built up my self-esteem by encouraging me. David Driscoll's life was truly blessed. His time at Howard University was the beginning of a life dedicated to scholarship. Today he is considered one of the world's leading authorities on African-American art. He earned his master's degree from Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and pursued postgraduate studies in Europe. Driscoll is an artist in his own right and has taught at universities worldwide. I think in so many ways, I am inheriting the, whatever that blessing was that my dad used to hold me up and uh, offer me up not only to God, but to the world. And I don't think that I can, uh, as long as I have breath, uh, move in any other direction, because that too was a mandate, to go forth and do good, and to help make this a better world. My pastor was the one that made me want to be a musician, Reverend Archie Fair. He was the guy that, um, played the guitar so good till I knew if I had a message I wanted to get to, to God. <laughs> just tell him. <laughs> well, you know, Isaac, it's sort of funny. All of my life, I never felt like that again 
until about eight or nine years ago, I met the Pope. I went to the Vatican and met the Pope. Mm -hmm. And that's the second time in my life that I felt like if I had a message, I could you know, get it over. Shoot it up there. That's so, right. <laughs> and the funny thing, I must tell you, they're not shut up. I gave the Pope a guitar. You know, he can play. The Pope can play guitar? People are laughing, but the Pope played guitar before he became the Pope. <laughs> wow. But anyway, after I gave him the guitar and we were leaving, my band was with me. They say, you know, do you hear that? I said, what? The Pope is playing, the thrill is gone. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> They, 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 they were lying, of course. <laughs> yeah, but he can play, though. B.B. King has been called one of the world's greatest blues guitar players, and it was his pastor that made him want to be a musician. He has recorded hit after hit, including The Thrill Is Gone, Let the Good Times Roll, When Love Comes to Town, and many, many others. To date, his honors include nearly a dozen Grammys, 27 Downbeat Awards, and four honorary doctorate degrees. I remember reading once where the, the great entrepreneur, um, uh, Ford, of the Ford uh, company, automobile oh, yeah. company, he said if he went broke, and if he could borrow, uh, borrow rather, a dollar from each of, each of his employees, he would still be a millionaire. So I believe today that if I could borrow a half a dollar from all of my friends, I could become a millionaire too. Wow, I say a lot. I say a lot, dude. My father was not a, a, a fan of organized religion. I never saw him go to bed at night without getting on the knees to pray, but he did not belong to a church, to, to an organized church, and seemingly he'd had some experience and he made a statement one day which, uh, if you're going to preach, be sure that you want to live the life that a preacher ought to live. And in other words, it sort of changed my viewpoint for a while. And so I did not follow. Uh, my first inclination, I think, was to go into the ministry. In December, Pearl Harbor came. And then things really opened up, uh, but I was already in college. And I stayed in college till 43. And uh, in August of 43, I was drafted. After training, he was sent overseas to fight in Italy. Now, Italy was a desperately poor country during World War II. So there wasn't much to buy, but they did have bars where they sold wine. And they had a lot of wine. <laughs> White soldiers tried to enforce segregation by saying to the owners, if you let black soldiers in here, then white soldiers won't come. But it never was able to take effect like they wanted to. The war finally ended in Europe, but it was far from over in the Pacific. So all of these divisions over in Europe were waiting to go to Japan for that last onslaught, in which we thought that thousands of people would be killed. I didn't look to get back because I'd read about how desperate the Japanese were and how much they fought and how much they were willing to die to protect their homeland. And I believe that they were willing to, you know, put forward an effort that would result in the death of many of them and many of us. It was then, as I met the white soldiers from their outfits, that it dawned on me that most of us were going to be a little bit different when we got back home. That even the white soldiers recognized that the kind of uh, segregation they had known was not going to always be. Japan surrendered before Benjamin Hooks and his fellow soldiers in Europe were needed. Twelve million men and women who went to the service came back different people. Then the GI Bill of Rights, the most phenomenally successful affirmative action program the world has ever known. They said to me, Ben Hooks, we took three years of your life. Took you from your family, your school, sent you to the army. Therefore, we're going to give you money to attend college, give you a monthly stipend, give you cheap insurance rates, let you buy a house, you know, all of that. That's an affirmative action program. And the same people who enjoyed the GI Bill of Rights 
fault against affirmative action for black people. Well, if they owe me something for taking three years of my life as a soldier, what about all those years they took because I was then and am not black? With the GI Bill in hand, Hooks, the war veteran, went straight to law school, but he soon found himself struggling with speaking in public. Somewhere in the last years of law school, I began to wonder why in the name of God was I in law school when I couldn't talk to 10 people. And one day, a man, Reverend Gladden, asked me to speak at his, at his church, and I agreed. And I wrote my little speech, and I wondered who was I writing it for, <laughs> because I knew I wasn't going to be able to deliver that speech. That Sunday morning when Reverend Gladney presented me and I had my little notes, I stood up to speak and, and I never had a problem and haven't had one since. And I was delivered from my bondage of fear of public speaking and since that time I've spoken to audiences more than 100,000 at one time. In other words, I was delivered that Sunday morning and that I call a miracle. I moved more and more toward the call to the ministry. And finally, in 1956, I told my pastor that I felt I'd been called to preach. Reverend Benjamin Hooks became a successful lawyer in Memphis, Tennessee, and was a leader in several civil rights organizations, including the Southern Christian Leadership Council. In 1972, he was appointed to the Federal Communications Commission and was the first black FCC commissioner. From 1977 to 1992, he served as executive director of the NAACP. Today, he continues to serve God and work for racial equality and justice. You had men and women who sat down and agonized and paid a price, who studied, strategized, tried to look through the future. How can we bring about change that would be meaningful and lasting? I thank God that I was a part of that cadre of people who help implement and make that change last. In this amazing world of ours, sometimes mysterious or divine things happen that we can't explain. It may be easy for some of us to shrug them off, but for the rest of us, it's evidence that something larger than ourselves is out there. Our ancestors knew this, but no matter what your beliefs, there's no denying that these events can have a profound effect on our lives. Listen to this story told by Ruby Dee to Angela Davis. That was a strange uh, time because when I met Ozzie and Jeb, I, I mean, I really didn't like him. I thought he was this very peculiar <laughs> looking person. <laughs> You know, he was about as big as a string bean, and you know, and he had this Adam's apple that sort of stuck out. You know, he was strictly from the country. I mean, <laughs> this tall guy, <laughs> you know, with sleeves that, that on his shirts that came in the middle of his arm, and, and, the, <laughs> and, and the pants came nowhere near his ankles. You know. <laughs> And he was this tall, skinny man dressed, you know, in the well-worn apparel of a short, fat man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and his understudy and I used to sit in the theater and we would talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> and we would say, well, where did he get his clothes? <laughs> but I do remember one day, and I, I'll just, you can stop me. Mm. I, um, <laughs> that I, he, he was on stage he played the part of a, re of a returning soldier and in, in, in the play Jeb by Robert Audrey. And he, at one point, he stood on the tie, slowly, you know, deliberately tying his tie in his uh, soldier's uniform. And I remember sitting in the audience and looking up at him, and, and um, I, I, something very peculiar happened, you know, because I hadn't been thinking about him in any particular way, and I had no romantic notions about him. But you know, as I watched him, I felt something like a, like a, a bolt of lightning. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, an electrical charge, you know, flashed between us. 
and I was so shocked. I never felt anything like that before. And if, I, I thought that was such a corny thing for me to be feeling. It was, a, it was so strange because I, I really didn't even like him. <laughs> I do remember that uh, sometime later, I told him about this strange sensation, sensation I had uh, as uh, he was working. And uh, because I was curious to know if he felt anything, I mean, it was such a <laughs> such a powerful thing, you know. And he says, and he says, um, and he says, uh, no, Ruby, I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> <coughs> and I was shocked, <laughs> but but we married anyway, you know. <laughs> Ruby Dee and Ossie Davis have been married for over 50 years. Both have appeared in countless plays, movies, and television shows. Miss Dee was the first African-American woman to play lead roles at the American Shakespeare Festival and has won an Emmy, an Obie, and many other awards, including the National Medal of Arts. She's also the author of books, plays, poems, and children's stories. I think most people what they do in their life. It's just meant to be. And you just have to flow with it like the river. Just flow with, with that. It's, it's not being beat around, kicked around, and all that kind of stuff, but understanding and standing up for what you believe in. I think my father felt that I was a special child. And he nurtured me a little bit the best he could. Many people do that today. Tiger Woods' dad, Venus Williams, Michael Joy, a lot of athletes, men and women, their parents, their fathers, nurture them to be whatever they're doing. That's what they want them to be. When I was drafted to go in the Army, my dad felt that I shouldn't go into the Army. He took me to a psychic, a voodoo. I didn't even ask the boy. He drove me to Palestine, Texas. That's a good name for a city. To this lady, and she sit and talk to him, so your son is a very special child. He said, well, he's going in the army. And she said, he's not going in the army. He's going to play baseball like you want him to play baseball. And he's going to be successful. I did go in the army. I hurt my knee as soon as I went in the army, and I spent most of the army life in the hospital in Texas. I got out of the hospital. I went back to my unit, and then we went to Germany. My knee got had a problem again. I went in the hospital there. And then when I got out, they were going around asking who played baseball in the unit. And that's where my life began. And the Cubs scouted me. I came to the Cubs in 53. And they chose me <laughs> to go to the Major Leagues. So when I came, I was just, you know, really surprised. I called my dad and said, gosh, Dad, going to the Major Leagues. You are. We are rich. You know, most people say that. We're going to be rich. And he laughed, yeah. He just said, yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, he, was, he didn't get excited about it at all. Ernie Banks became the most popular player in Chicago Cubs history, earning the National League's Most Valuable Player Award in 1958 and 1959. After 18 seasons with the Cubs, he retired, having hit 512 home runs. In 1977, he was elected to Baseball's Hall of Fame. I feel that everything is a miracle. I mean, that my life is in divine order. I can't point it out. It's like a miracle, all the things that happened in my life.
Do you have a favorite phrase or saying? Well, I've had a, I have a couple, maybe. Um, eBay uh, uh, which means it'll get better. Uh, I chant that a lot in the morning, and I give it to a lot of students so they can uh, also uh, chant it or say it. Um, because in that way, you know, when you say things, you can make it better. When I first got out of school, I answered an ad in the New York Times, and they asked me to send an example of my writing, and I did. I got a telegram on a Saturday to report to work on Monday. At 9 o'clock, I was hired. And so I went around the house showing this to my father, C, 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 C. I mean, he halfway knew that I like to write, you know. You can't, I can't get a job as a writer. I jumped up and down. I showed that telegram to everybody and their mama. I was so excited. I was like, whoa, look at this, look at this. And I went out on a Monday morning, and I was all 20 years of age, right? I got downtown at 8.30 instead of 9 o'clock, and I'm standing outside waiting. And up comes this woman who evidently is the secretary of reception. As I showed the telegram, she looked at me, she opened the door, I went in. And so uh, about 10 or 5 minutes to 9, the guy came in and said, I'm so sorry the job is taken. So I said, well, no. I showed him the telegram. I said, look, look, it's not 9 o'clock. I said, I was supposed to report at 9 o'clock. Should I go out and report at 9 o'clock? Then I'll be OK. I just came at 8.30, right? And the guy just did, they looked at it, he looked at me, handed it back, said, the job is taken. You do not have a job, so you just, you should just leave. And I said, oh, I got it. It's discrimination. You're discriminating against me because, you know, um, I'm black. And the guy looked at me. I started to cry. And I remember it said, I am going to report them to the Urban League because the Urban League will do something about this, right? And I got on the train. That train in New York? led Sonia Sanchez right to an unexpected place. I got off 135th Street and I passed this building. And lo and behold, it said Schomburg Library. And I went inside there and I said to a guard who was standing outside smoking, I said, what kind of library is this? He said, lady, go inside. Just sign a book, go inside. Uh, the woman inside would tell you. Miss Hudson's her name. So I walked inside. And and the woman said, yes, dear, can I help you? And I said, what kind of library is this, the Schomburg? She said, this library is called the Schomburg. It has books in here only by and about black folks. And then I said with my smart ass self, I said, there must not be many books in here then. She told me to sit down, and she would bring me some books. And she brought me souls of black folk up from slavery, and their eyes were watching God. <laughs> And she put their eyes for watching God on top. And she said, here, dear, you, now you read these and be quiet. And I started reading their eyes for watching God. And I was so stricken by the beauty of that book. I eased out of my chair. And I went and knocked on the door. And I said to her, what's your name again? She said, Miss Hudson, dear. I said, Miss Hudson, how could I be an educated woman here in New York City and not have read this book? She said, yes, dear, I know. That's why we're here now. Go back and read some more. Something led Sonia Sanchez to that library in Harlem, and that experience opened a whole new world for her. She was deeply inspired by the works of African-American writers and would become an award-winning poet. She continues to write poetry, but also teaches and is the author of plays and children's books. And every morning I get up and I uh, look in the mirror and I chant, uh, eBay, eBay, yeah, 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 it'll get better. And then I smiled and said, like, of course, if you work to make it better, Sonia, it will get better. And that's what we have to do. Life is made up of many turning points. And sometimes all it takes is one good person to help you make that right turn. In fact, you don't have to wait for someone to show you the way. You can be that person for someone else. You're about to see how lives were changed just because someone stepped in and cared. I was nine and a half. Uh, I was told that my father had an ancestral relationship with my sister, and they uh, bore a child together, which tore the family up. My parents separated. We had to uh, deal with the shame of that. Mm -hmm. 
My father abandoned us. We lived in the 10 room house in Queens he had bought. After a while, couldn't pay the bills. So finally we lived for months with no lights, no gas, no transportation. Until my mother just finally had to abandon it and move to the projects in Brooklyn and go on welfare. So it was very traumatic in terms of not only the public shame, but the readjusting to a different lifestyle, the leaving of your friends and loved ones, just being totally uprooted and put in a total different, hostile environment almost overnight. Often in our darkest hour, a person is placed in our lives just when we need them. For Reverend Al Sharpton, that person was Bishop F.D. Washington. Bishop Washington used to read a lot. I used to sit in his office after services and he'd just read and underline passages in a book. And I remember developing that habit even before I could read well. I used to sit with a book and just underline it, trying to look like Bishop Washington. I think he, in his own way, thought I would grow up and probably inherit the church, or at least a church. So he saw a combination of himself, a protege, a student, and uh, he was very encouraging. He became uh, my surrogate father for my early years. Bishop Washington believed in giving people his best, even when I've seen him sick in pain. He taught me that people came to you to be ministered to, and it's not fair to let your own personal feelings, shortcomings, crisis, situation interfere with you providing for them what they need. The advice and spiritual guidance Reverend Sharpton received during those early years would provide him with a strong spiritual foundation. It's a foundation he would draw on years later in 1991. Bensonhurst, New York was the scene of a murder where white teens shot and killed a black teenager named Yusef Hawkins. For months, marches protested, and it was during one such rally that Al Sharpton was stabbed two inches from his heart. He had one stab wound underneath his left clavicle. The entrance wound was quite small. According to the uh, police on the scene, this was more um, likely a stab wound done in an upward direction. The instrument that was used was relatively long, about three and a half inches, stiletto. All your life you talk about you die for a cause. You never really, really know till you lay in there and don't know if you're going to live or die. And when I laid there and had no regrets and said to myself, I don't make it, it's all right with me. I knew that in my own heart, it doesn't matter who believes what about me, I knew that I was being very sincere and that I was willing to die for this. I also said if I make it, I'm going to be even more deliberate and careful to make sure that everything I do counts maximum. Sharpton recovered and in 2004 ran in the race for President of the United States. I always had the sense that uh, no matter what good things or big things I've done, it will not equal the things I'm going to do, which is why I don't sleep late because I'm excited about what I'm going to do that day. Next are more true stories that show us when faith is your foundation, no mountain is too high, no valley too low. One of the things that was clear in my family was that there was injustice in the world. And we talked about it, and we talked about how you overcome that, and you talked about struggling. And, and so all of it was around how you can make a difference in this world. Um, and obviously, like any other black kid growing up in a segregated South, I absolutely hated any boundaries on me. I hated being told I couldn't do something or go anywhere. And so I don't remember a time when I was not dreaming about how one was going to change that and change injustice. My father, now the more and more I think about him, just extraordinary. I mean, I, he, he read, he thought, you know, he, um, he was clearly very much affected by the war, but he was also very much affected by his parents. Um, and um, believed very deeply in family. He used to make me read with him every evening. Um, and there were always books. Um, and education was always there, but it was always education to give back and to leave the world better. Her father was a pastor. He knew about service, service to God, service to church, family, and community. Before he died, 
he left his daughter Marion words of wisdom she never forgot. I now know in retrospect that in some ways he prepared us. I mean, the Sunday he preached his last sermon, which is on the 139th Psalm, in a sense told us that he was going to die, go away, but we needn't be afraid, and, and there was no place you could go where God was not. Um, and I remember running out of church and going up to his study and saying, you're going to die. Um, and he said, it's okay, don't be afraid. And he was gone by the end of that week. But again, the, the, the courage and the preparation and the ability to say that God is here. Marian Wright Edelman kept her father's words in her heart. She graduated from Yale University Law School and became the first African-American female admitted to the Mississippi Bar Association. She gained prominence as an advocate for Head Start and later served as president of the Children's Defense Fund. In 2000, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. She often credits her parents for her success. They were always, both of them, keeping up on the latest literature. In my mother's case, it was church music or the latest things that were going on and, and with church women. Um, but boy, I, they, I, I now understand that we were just extraordinarily blessed with, with two parents who were intelligent, who were committed, who believed in education, and who, um, you know, shared that with the community. So people often ask, why did you do what you do? I said, I said it never occurred to me not to do what I do, because that is the example that I saw day in and day out, serving the poor, trying to live the gospel. And they never let us down. They were always who we thought they were. Um, they spoke the truth, they tried to live the truth, and um, you try to live up to those expectations. My mother used to say, God watches over fools and babies. <laughs> we never knew which ones we were, sometimes the fools, sometimes the babies. But uh, he always was watching over us. When we got to L.A., of course, we didn't have any money, and so we were taking the bus everywhere and bumming rides with our friends, like with mom's friends. And so they sent me out on this commercial audition, and we had to take the bus. It seemed like it took forever to get there. When we got there, um, there were all of these little girls, all these little girls, and I didn't have any teeth in the front, you know, and I just felt like, oh my God, what am I doing here, you know? And Janet Jackson was there, and I just really thought, oh God, take me home now. And I just thought, she's gonna get it, she's freaking Janet Jackson, Mom, let, let's go, <laughs> why are you making this so hard? And honey, my mother took me in the bathroom, and she said, let me tell you something, don't you let anyone or anything intimidate you, you go in there and you just do your best. All right. And I went in there and I did my best. And uh, we went home and I'm still thinking, all right, yeah, fine, I did my best, but she's still Janet Jackson, so, you know. And by the time we'd gotten home, the agents and the casting directors had called and said that there was something wrong with either the tape or something that happened and I had to come back. Well, at that point, the buses had stopped running. So mom, again, God watching over us, hitchhiked. And uh, this guy, I think he was in a Porsche or something, he stopped, gave us a ride to this audition, and, uh, and I got the job. That job launched a career for Kim Fields. Before her 11th birthday, she was starring as Tootie in the hit show, The Facts of Life. After graduating from college, Kim won a role next to Queen Latifah in the show, Living Single. She continued to appear in popular sitcoms and films, but branched out into producing and directing. Fields is also the president of an entertainment company. Every time I've gone into a meeting or um, a producer session or an audition or anything that puts me in that same kind of mode where I feel somewhat intimidated or a little anxious or anything like that, now I take myself into the bathroom and I have that same talk with myself, don't be intimidated, do your best, you know, and, uh, and that, that, that has just always stuck with me. I started working when I was 12 or 13. I just put my age up and got a job in Thompson's Restaurants in St. Louis where I was a bus girl. I cleaned the tables. It was a segregated restaurant and uh, we had to eat our food in the basement. <laughs> Every summer I had a job. I always worked, bought my clothes for the school year, um, and you know, basically uh, had 
what I needed for the entire school year from my work through the summer. Then I went to work in garment factories uh, in St. Louis. You learn a lot about life working in those kinds of jobs. You learn a lot about people. You learn a lot about um, prejudices. Um, you learn a lot about uh, yourself. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's that, that stage of your life where you're making lots of decisions about how you're going to relate to the world, uh, what you're going to accept, what you're not going to accept, all of those things. I almost consider everything that happens to me a great learning experience. In my home coming up, I remember the social workers. We were on welfare much of the time that I was growing up. And the social workers who came to your house uh, were always, uh, you know, the professional that uh, you got to see. And uh, of course, you admired their clothes and the fact that they were educated. And, you know, they had a little power. They had the power to determine whether or not you eat, you know. So that's why I aspired to be a social worker. Waters continued to get work wherever she could, but she never let go of her dream to be a social worker even while raising a family of her own. I always knew that I would go back to school. You just had to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, every September, watching um, you know, people return to school was always something, it was a longing that I had while I was raising my children. She finally made it to college, but she had to keep working to pay bills and tuition. One of my dear friends who worked with me would visit me and we would talk a lot about what was going on. And we started to talk about what we were reading in the papers about the war on poverty and this wonderful program called Head Start where poor kids were going to have the opportunity to have uh, a preschool experience. I got hired as an aide in Head Start. And Head Start uh, opened up for me a whole new way of thinking about who I was and all of the experiences that I had, I was able then to connect them uh, to what I really wanted to be. And I was able to come to grips kind of with my philosophy of life. I mean, I was free. Don't forget, I was aspiring to be a social worker. And Head Start thrust me into interaction with the parents with all of the problems of social work. Maxine Waters also learned about politics. We were still fighting for funding for Head Start because remember, the war on poverty, uh, it, was, it started out pretty shaky. I mean, and the funding and you had to fight for it. And so this brought me in touch with politicians. And we started to see the politicians and you got to know, you know, kind of what their role was and to kind of lie with them. And then, you know, you met the people around them and would ask you to come work in their campaigns. And that was only the beginning for Maxine Waters. She served 14 years in the California State Assembly, and then in 1992, she was elected to Congress. She's been there ever since. In 2002, she won her seventh term in the House of Representatives. I still feel that at a very early age, I had a glimmer or glimpse into the possibilities. Didn't know where I was going and how I was going to get there, but never felt that I was not capable of doing something special, something important, and something that would be very satisfying. Thank you for joining us for History Makers Talking Truth. We hope that the stories you've heard will encourage you to make a positive difference in your life and in the world. You can do it. Just remember, wherever you are in your life, have faith. I'm James A.
The following program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org. Teacher, businesswoman, philanthropist. Her life has taken her from Chicago's heartland to the corporate boardroom and to luxury hotels. Her name is Sheila Johnson. The History Makers, the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive is proud to present An Evening with Sheila Johnson. And now to our host, veteran PBS TV journalist, Miss Gwen Ifor. Good evening. I'm pleased to be back here again tonight. Let me tell you about the story we're gonna hear tonight. From philanthropist to entertainer to sports mogul, she has made her mark. Let's listen, Sheila Johnson. I promised you I would give her what I gave Barry Gordy, which is to say just a chance to chat and to tell us about her life, which has, I have to say, I want to be her when I grow up. And someone told me I was already grown up, so I'd miss my moment. But I want to start by talking about your roots. Absolutely. The, the basics. Where did you come from? Well, I was born in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, moved around this entire great country 14 times, and finally settled right here outside of Chicago in Maywood, Illinois. But grew up with two incredible parents. My father was a neurosurgeon, my mother was an accountant, and they gave me the best possible life. They weren't just incredible, they were extraordinary for African Americans in their time. Absolutely. I mean, my father really had battles. I mean, in a sense, he still had to struggle as a doctor. There were only 11 neurosurgeons in the country at that time and could not practice in white hospitals. And so that's why I had to move all over the place. I find that people like to tell the stories of incredibly high achieving African Americans by talking about our bootstrap stories, how we came from nothing. But in fact, yours is a slightly different story. You came from a solidly middle-class upbringing. Daddy a doctor is pretty much as up middle-class yes. or upper-class as it gets. Let's take a look at that. Born to a neurosurgeon father and an accountant mother, Sheila Johnson grew up in Maywood, Illinois, where she began to play the violin at age eight. At Proviso High School, education violin and cheerleading became her passions, earning her a music scholarship to the University of Illinois. It was 1966, the height of the civil rights movement. College campuses were rocked by protests and unrest. But Sheila's deep commitment to classical music would only grow stronger. Now, music was a huge part of your life. Talk about how it wove itself in, even until today. It was your father who you first saw playing the piano. Oh, yes. He would come home from operations, and you know, like a lot of people after a stressful day, they hit the bar. My father hit the piano keys, and he would sit down and just play Chopin. He would, he would play 
everything on the piano. He's just a very gifted, gifted musician. Is, is it true that you actually witnessed him playing with blood on his white yes, coat? Yes, he would have little spots of blood after, and I would say, Daddy, at least you could change. You think? Yeah. <laughs> But he would drag me to the hospital. He really wanted me to be a doctor more than anything in the what world. What happened? There was just no way. <laughs> no way. Yeah. But let's start by talking about your upbringing, which I guess the best word for it is peripatetic. I love that word, and I think it absolutely applies. I'm a preacher's kid. We moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. You moved around more. Because we had to. I mean, my father um, could not stay in one hospital more than 10 months because they kept transferring him because he was with the VA hospital. So we moved all over the East Coast, a little bit to the Midwest, and then finally settled here. Because he just put his foot down. He said, look, I can't move anymore. I've got to get my family established. So we moved to Maywood, Illinois. But during that time, even with all of the racial unrest, I was able to cross racial lines. And I think it helped me build a resilience. That, that's an interesting point, because I hated it at the time, moving. But you learned how to walk in a room. You really learned how to walk in a room and you learned how to just assimilate with everyone. And I think that's what's important. It, it strengthened me in many ways. So this is interesting. Our, our black parents in the 60s had a couple of different ways of responding to their children's deciding that they knew themselves. <laughs> there were a couple of options. One is to say, you go for it. And the other was to say, who do you think you are? It was more, growing up in an African-American family, you know, you're seen but really not heard, and if you challenged. Right. I was challenging everything from my parents to my teachers. I could never take no for an answer. And that's who I am. I, you know, don't tell me I can't do something. Because the more you say you can't do something, the more I'm gonna challenge you. When in your life do you think you were first exposed to the concept of race? I would say all the way back as far as kindergarten, because I remember going to play with a little girl and some mother yelled at me and she said, you know what, we don't allow, and she used the N word really? in our in house. In kindergarten? In kindergarten, and I do remember that. Now in the second grade, moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and now my father was very fair, my father, my mother was not. And this was right during segregation, and I was not allowed to go to the white schools. And my father would not have anything to do with it. And we pulled it off for a whole year down in Louisville, Kentucky. My mother could never show up at the school, but I went to this little elementary school in the second grade, and he would show up. He would take me to school. They never knew. They never knew. It. And we pulled it off until we had to move again. It was that proviso that you mentioned mm -hmm. where you began to learn about how to assert yourself and how to be in charge and how to push back a little bit. Yeah. I mean, those were times that were daunting because the world was changing. And you could feel it changing. And all the way into, by the time I got to the University of Illinois, I mean, all H broke lo loose. But it was just the way, it was the time when I had to grow up and really figure out who I really was. What was gonna motivate me and where I was gonna go in life. And I had decided I was gonna be a violinist and a teacher. And there were teachers that, you know, would not let me do what I needed to do and I had to push back. And this really even continued all the way through college because the time I made the cheerleading squad at the University of Illinois, they asked me to leave the music school. And I said, why? And they said, well, we don't have cheerleaders in the music school. So I had to go and petition with Dan Perino to get myself back into the University of Illinois School of Music. And yeah. I will never forget that. You were the only black. I was the first, first African, black cheerleader. Yes, at the University of Illinois. Why did you want to be a cheerleader? I was a cheerleader in high school, a cheerleader in elementary school. That was before Title IX. And I love sports and I love being athletic. Do you remember any cheers? Um, <laughs> I remember on proviso, on proviso, ever loyal, whatever it was. <laughs> You know and she remembers more, but she's not going to do it tonight. We're loyal to you, Illinois. We're orange and blue, Illinois. <laughs> I don't remember any of that stuff. That's good. Let's go back to your musical roots, because yes. I am 
of all the things you could have done, like you just sang a little bit for us, you have a lovely singing voice, but you were drawn to violin. What yes. about the violin? I don't know what it was, but my father always wanted me to, and my brother, had to, we had to take piano lessons, which I'm glad he made us do, because that really gave me a basis. Something about the violin really intrigued me. I don't know whether it was the complexity of it, I loved the way it sounded, and it was a challenge. But what did you plan to do with that? You said you planned to be a music teacher. That was your goal. My goal, well, I, I love playing in the orchestra, and I love playing string quartets, and I love playing solos. And I did all of that, but I also love teaching. I love teaching children how to make music. And I think that every child in this country should be exposed to music because it helps you to focus, you become so organized, it teaches you to listen, it teaches communication. But do you worry that we're doing that less and less and I less? worry about it all the time. I mean, everything has changed. They're so into technology that they've lost the basis of communication. I taught at the lab school also in Washington, D.C., and we discovered the kids at the age of three who cannot repeat simple rhythmic patterns at the age of three are going to be very poor readers. Mm. Reading is rhythmical. Everything we do from spelling to walking, all of this is rhythmical. It is all the foundation of music. And it's how you got recruited to go to the University of Illinois. Yes, and I have to say Susan Starr played a huge part in that. Tell me she, about your relationship. Well, Susan and I, I think it was her first job coming out of college, and we just connected. Of course, you set boundaries, teacher and student, but I admired her and still do. Admired her very much. She really, uh, there's a presence about her and there's character there and integrity. And even though my parents taught me all of that, to see that through someone else. She was really a role model. I remember even standing in front of the mirror practicing the violin, so I looked like her <laughs> playing the violin, but she, she was also the person that I could communicate with. You know, you can communicate with your parents, but it's always nice to have someone else. And she was there for me, she rooted for me, and she helped me get into college and pick the right teachers. And she's, to this day, has watched over me. She's my guardian angel. And now, Susan Starrett. Susan <laughs> That's Carolyn Hansen on the piano. Thank you both very much. Thank you.
playing Mendelssohn's Spring Song. Now, tell me about Paul Rowland. Paul Rowland was my taskmaster teacher. I mean, <laughs> he was the, the person that all violinists, especially from this state and beyond, wanted to study with. And to get the opportunity to study with Paul Rowland, you have hit the top. And that's what the Illinois String Research Project was. Yes, and he started the Illinois String Research Project because when Suzuki came into the country, the Department of Education was very, very worried about Suzuki taking over the string teaching method. So he got a grant, uh, it was a $500,000 grant from the Department of Education to study how we can better train string students in this country. So he started the Illinois, University of Illinois String Research Project, and I was the only undergrad that was recruited into this project. It strikes me you were a very different kind of student on that campus. It was the 1960s. Everything everywhere was in uproar. You're a black student, but at one point considered joining a white sorority. You were great at violin, white music. Yes. You, whatever. It must have been different for you to be a standout on that campus at that it time. It was. I was really in a vacuum. Right. Because at the time, you had the black fraternities and sororities, and they, didn't, they thought that I was too fair to be a part of that. Yeah. But yet, I didn't fit into the white community either, so I was sort of this oddball at the University of Illinois the only African American in the School of Music. Now, it's not insignificant that you were 16 when you went to college. That's right. And you were 20 when you got married for the first time. I was 20 when I got married. Now, at 20, I barely knew my way from here to there. And neither did I. So, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> but getting married early put you on another path. It did. I, I met Bob Johnson, and I was intrigued with him. And the thing that stood out he had a fire in his belly. He really wanted to set the world on fire, like I wanted to. And so I said, I'm gonna hitch my wagon to him and we could change the world. And in a way, we did. Absolutely. We changed it. Well, let's we take... We did what we had to do. Well, among other things, you got to live abroad, you got to found companies, but you also, your move, actually, your marriage and your connection also brought you to Washington, D.C. for the it first time. brought it to Washington, D.C. He wanted to be, go into the Foreign Service and it didn't work out, it was not his cup of tea, and so he came and worked for the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, and I started working at Sidwell Friends School. Let's take a look. Okay. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. 1972, the year of the Watergate scandal would bring the young couple to the nation's capital, where Sheila taught music at the prestigious Sidwell Friends School. She also created a youth orchestra, and this led to an invitation from Queen Noor of Jordan to establish a music conservatory there. By 1979, they convinced TCI's John Malone to loan them $500,000 to found Black Entertainment Television. I want to showcase the, the dynamic vitality of Black Entertainment yeah. community. Yeah. Sheila, who signed the loan on BET's first Georgetown office, would later serve as BET's Executive Vice President of Community Affairs. Balancing her responsibilities, she would also become the doting mother of her daughter, Paige, and her son, Brett, before she and her husband sold the network to Viacom in 2001. I drink my fill, and even though I'm 
satisfied I'm hungry still to see what's down another road beyond the hill and do it all Okay, so you get to Washington, D.C., yes. and you don't aim low, you aim high, and you launched this teaching career you've been aiming for at no less an institution than Sidwell Friends School, which is yes. one of the most elite schools in the nation. Absolutely. How did you end up there? They were looking for a music teacher, but they really wanted a teacher that could play the guitar. And I said, well, I need this job desperately. I'm going to say that I can play the guitar because I could either teach myself but once I got in there and got to really talk with the faculty, I, I told them what I really wanted to do was to really start a string orchestra. They became one of the top orchestras in the city of Washington. We call them Young Strings in Action because they just didn't sit and play, but they moved around and performed. And they performed everywhere from the Cork at the Corcoran Ball to the Woolly Mammoth Theaters. I mean, they were performing all the time. And the greatest day that I remember was when we were performing at the old post office pavilion and Queen Noor's delegation had come in. I guess they were doing a tour of the city and just happened to be in there. And Queen she- Queen of Jordan. Of Jordan, yes. And so I did end up at the Jordanian ambassador's home and there were nothing but men in there. And they quizzed me on my politics and they wanted to know a lot about Jesse Jackson. Huh. And they said, do you, do you like Jesse Jackson? I said, yes, I, yeah. What year was this? 
Oh God, this was uh, 1970. So before he ran for like, president. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So they were quizzing me, and then and this went on for two hours. And then after that was over, the women came in, and they were carrying food, and the party started. It was really quite an honor. So we became sort of the cultural ambassadors with the United States Information Agency. They brought the kids back four times, and it was not just about music, but it was about politics and the whole culture of how we can em really get along. Once again, expanding your and their horizons. Exactly. How do you get from that to BET? Well, this is really interesting. Someone had to make some money to pay the bills. <laughs> and we were not pulling in a dime. So we were struggling in getting BET started. And we were only on, what, two hours a week when we started out. Really? And, yeah. And we had some pretty bad programming. <laughs> I mean, uh, remember, I do remember, remember that. Remember Petey Green? Yeah. Yeah, we had Petey Green eating some collard greens and some pork chops on the air. And I was, <laughs> this is how you, I mean, that's how bad the program was. We were desperate. We had to get on the air. It was a struggle. It was hard getting um, advertisers because that's what pays the bills. But how, then, when did it explode? When did it turn? When did you go from worrying about paying the mortgage to having success on your hands? Oh, that was about five to six years in. We wow. knew that it was going to start moving. But you also have to understand, John Malone really kept us afloat right. all the way to the very end. You know, we were very lucky to get that $3 billion sale from Viacom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that would ever happen again. No, oh, probably so we, not. We, we were very, very lucky. I want to talk about yeah. Teen Summit. That's my show. That, that was, was your my, show. That was my show. And that was... Huge. I wanted to start that show because I don't know if you all remember when the videos started. They started out really nice. They told a story. It was almost like little mini documentaries that were fun to watch. And then suddenly, I would say about seven months in, they went south real quick. And I was very disturbed about what I saw on the screen and the way women were being, young girls were being portrayed. I didn't like it at all. Young people said, well, you just don't understand our music. I said, I'm a musician. I understand your music, but I don't like what I'm seeing on the screen. And I started this show because I wanted these young people to have a voice. Our young people, for some reason, and our parents, they don't really talk to one another. And this was an opportunity where I could get a group, I called them my posse, of 25 young people where on Friday evenings we could discuss issues that we wanted to talk about live on Saturday morning and really start a dialogue and a communication of what's really going on in their lives. And I felt as though that they could talk with their own peer level. So it was just like us having this conversation here. They had that conversation on Teen Summit. We shot in front of a live studio audience. And, and these young kids would really talk about anything from, we called it checkerboard dating, to HIV, even talking about sex. Yeah. And um, we, we did a show where we had the parents come. Well, one of the posse members told the parents says, Mom, I'm having sex with my girlfriend. Well, the woman passed out. <laughs> I mean, but I think more than anything, it really helped them communicate better. And one of the things that we did launch, and we did this through the Clinton administration, remember the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Program? Yes. That launched on Teen Summit. And that was huge because at that time, there was an enormous epidemic of teen pregnancy, and it's probably still going on. They're just not talking about it anymore. But especially in the Mississippi area, Texas had a huge teen pregnancy rate. But we traveled all over the country to really talk about these issues. And I had doctors that would go with me, but this was something that was really important. But it was a magazine format show where we talked about the issues. And, and just like as we're doing this, we also had music. And we had our little fly girls on the side. <laughs> but it, it was an amazing show. It's about this time in your life where the, this theme begins to emerge, which is transforming. You kept transforming yourself. You transformed. You decided that when you moved on from BET, mm -hmm. you moved on from your first marriage, 
And somewhere in the w along the way, you discovered salamander farms. Yeah, this is really interesting because I was going through a major transition in my life then. And, you know, as anybody who's going through a divorce, you're trying to figure out who am I, where am I going to go, where's my passion, what's going to keep me going. Now, most people, women, they sit back and they're still licking their wounds and they don't know which way they wanted to go. I knew that I wanted to do something. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I was restless. And all of the work that I had done behind the scenes in BET and really had done what I needed to do to get that company successful. And it was very interesting because when I moved to, to the Middleburg area and I bought this farm, it was called, first it was called Cotswold. So when I met with Bruce Sunland face to face and asked him if I could have the name, and he says, of course you can. I said, well, what does a salamander mean? He says, well, it really means it's the only animal that can walk through fire and still come out alive. Mm. And you know if you chop off its limbs, they regenerate. And I said, you know what? Hit me right in the face. I said, I'm the salamander. And it stands for perseverance, fortitude, and courage. You walk through fire and, and you came still out alive. come out alive. And from that point on, I became the salamander and I was gonna move forward. And I was not only gonna come out alive, but I was gonna come out on top. And that was what was important. And another way of describing it is that when, um, when doors close, close, windows open. Yeah. Let's take a look. In 2005, Sheila founded Salamander Hotels and Resorts opening her flagship Salamander Resort and Spa in Middleburg, Virginia, eight years later. The resort doesn't feel like a hotel. They really do feel like they've walked into a grand home. She also made history when she became a partner in monumental sports and entertainment as the first African-American woman to own three major sports franchises. The WNBA's Washington Mystics, the NBA's Wizards, and the NHL's Capitals. And she's money again in the clutch. No, I can sleep the night before, but I'll tell you, if we lose, I don't sleep very well that <laughs> night. <laughs> her philanthropy has taken her from care to the Jackie Robinson Foundation, Parsons, the new school for design, and establishing a fellowship at Harvard University. For Sheila Johnson, this is just the beginning. Okay, just the beginning. I want, I want you to indulge me and talk to me a little bit about the power of transformation. I think most people reach midlife and they think, okay, I'm done. Uh, this is as far as it's going to take me. I don't really have the energy. I don't want to try. But you, at every step along the way, have tried something completely different from what you did before. Absolutely. Something has happened in my life when I decided to make that switch. And I don't know why it happened, but things started to happen for me personally. It's when I decided to start a new life. I not only met my new wonderful husband, which is a whole Who other is story. Here tonight. He's here tonight. Where, where is he? He's right here in the front. Oh, hi. Say hi. Tell everybody hi. <laughs> William Newman, Judge William Newman. But opportunities came along. Now, they weren't in my face opportunities, but you know what? I learned to open up more, to really see what was going on around me, and to see what was really speaking to me. So I got a call one day about buying 347 acres of Pamela Harriman's property. And I said, well, let me go see the property. I walked up on there and the light bulb went off. I said, I'm going to build a resort. Yeah, I knew the struggles of the town. I knew what was going on and what wasn't going on. The town was in economic turmoil. Hmm. And I said, you know, I'm here. I have the financial ability to make changes. So one of the things that I did is every time I came into Middleburg, I was very offended by one building, and it had a Confederate flag in the window. It was a gun shop. And every time I drove in this, went on for about a year or two. And I finally called my lawyer. I said, there's this building in town I want to buy. 
I said, don't tell them who I am. I'm going to buy this building. And I bought it. <laughs> and I took that flag right out of that window. <laughs> I then gutted it. And I turned it into the most beautiful, it's one design awards, a food market. And you can have breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. I, I work with the farmers in the area. Everything's organic. And then I started a huge garden on my own farm, which I supply that market. I decided that I was going to put, build this resort, and I had a little uh, announcement up on the property. Everybody showed up, from County Board of Supervisors to Willard Scott, you name them. <laughs> they grazed through my food. They thought it was a wonderful idea. The next day, I was going to Dulles Airport, and there were signs on both sides of the road that said, don't be E.T. Middleburg. And I, oh, I don't yeah. BET Middleburg. Yep. So you know what was starting to happen. Wow. I forgot I was south of the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> and some people don't think the Civil War is over. Yeah. So for the next 10 years, I fought the battle. I'll call it the Battle of Sheila and Middleburg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was horrendous. The racial hate mail that I got. Really? Oh, yeah. And it, it just escalated. And it went on. There were terrible articles in newspapers being written about me of how I was destroying the countryside. And it just went on and on. And there were hearings after hearings after hearings. But at the end of 10 years, I won. 10 years. 10 years. I hung in there. Because I really believed. This resort was going, they needed this. That resort is up, as you saw. Not only has it changed in a great way the economic structure, it's very diverse. But what is more important, I have African Americans that are coming into that town. And you see them jogging through the town and walking and shopping. And the economy couldn't be better. <laughs> But, okay, here's the real thing. On one hand, you've created this wonderful hospitality enterprise. Mm -hmm. You've revived this town, which tried to drive you out. That's great. You could have been done. But somehow you become an owner of three sports teams. Mm -hmm. This is a story about never burn your bridges. I had gotten to know Abe Poland, and he was the owner of the Wizards. Abe Poland also had the same sort of struggle of building an arena in downtown Washington over in Chinatown. And Washington, D.C. was bankrupt, and he really persevered, and he was able to get this arena built. And I was really behind him vocally and supporting him. And one day he approached me and he said, Sheila, I would like you to come to my office next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. And I said, for what? He says, you'll see. So I went in, and I just barely got in my seat. And he goes, Sheila, I'm an old man. And I really would like you to be the face of the Washington Mystics. And I was stunned. I was stunned because a woman has never been offered a sports team, never. Mm. And I said, why me? And he goes, why not you? And he's, I said, well, I'm, I'm intrigued. He says, you really would be the best owner for this team. And I, I said, well, I've got to see the financials. He says, I will give them to you right now. And he says, I'd, I'd really like to know in about 48 hours what you're going to do. Otherwise, I've got to <laughs> move, on. move on. So, and he says, this is highly confidential. Do not speak to anyone about it. Of course, I got in the car, called my lawyer. And I said, uh, Sandy, I'm on my way. I said, i got to talk to you about something important. And I said, I know I don't have an appointment, but I've been offered a sports team. He says, Sheila, you're not going to buy a sports team. He says, do not. He says, they don't make money. I said, if you were offered a sports team, would you take it? And he was silence. I said, I know you would. See? And that's what men do. They exactly. just plunge right on into it. I said, I will be there in 10 minutes. So in that 10 minutes, I thought about it. And I said, why should I just own the women's team? Why can't I go for all of them? And so <laughs> I got to the office. And I said, I want you to call Ted Leonsis. He owns the Capitals. 
and I know he has first right of refusal with the Wizards. I said, let's make him an offer he can't refuse. So I talked to Ted, and he loved the idea. He says, let me take it back to the other partners. And they voted me in, and I'm vice chairman of Monumental Sports and Entertainment. You know, I don't, I don't quite know how you keep all of these balls in the air, because you, you've talked about their, their transformation in your career as a musician, your transformation as an educator, your transformation as an entertainment mogul, as a hospitality mogul, and now as a sports mogul. And in the middle of all this, or along the way, you also kind of transformed your personal life, something that women often overlook. Yes. When you remarried, when you married your lovely husband here. Yes. How much did you think to yourself, oh, there's this other piece I have to figure out? while I was doing all this other success. I had no intention of getting married again. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. But the day that I went to go get my divorce, I saw this judge sitting up. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I think I know this man. Bill and I actually did a play together called Ceremonies and Dark Old Men. There were open auditions for this part in Ceremonies, and so I just went and auditioned. I got a call two weeks later saying I got the part. That little 25 minutes up on the stage, I got paid three times the amount of money doing that than when I was teaching. And so this play ran for 98 performances. And we closed it down. So then I never saw that. Now, I was married at the time. I was a good girl. I never saw him. I never saw him again until I walked into that courtroom for the, my divorce. And so I turned to my lawyer, and I said, I think I know the judge. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 no. I said, I haven't seen him in over 30 years. He said, good. He says, let, let, let's, let's get this done. <laughs> And I did. <laughs> and then I, he says, now you can go talk to him. I said, Your Honor, may I approach the bench? And I said, do you remember me? And he goes, oh, yes, I do. And he kept his face. <laughs> so one day, I was shortly after, well, after we got married, I was taking my son to school, and I was listening to Tom Joyner and, and Sybil, because she says, <laughs> Can you believe that story about Sheila Johnson and Bill Newman? I heard that. You heard that? He <laughs> says, where it said, to the bailiff, two martinis and hold the olives. <laughs> I want to talk about the loves of your life, Paige mm -hmm. and Brett. Yes. Tell us about your kids. My kids are extraordinary. They're very smart. My daughter, from since the age of three, has always wanted to be on the back of a horse. And that happened when I was at a cable meeting down in Antigua. And she was this really rambunctious little girl, and she wouldn't sit still. And so I took her down there. Four hours later, she was still on the back of the horse. And that has continued. She's 30 years old. She's professional. She was on the Nations Cup team. She's won two major Grand Prix. Wow. She runs her business herself. My son, Brett. He has become an incredible designer of men's outerwear. I travel with him to Italy, and he really wants me to check everything that he does, from his sketches all the way to the fabrics. That's great. I also find amazing that at some point in all of your career, in all of your successes, you have to stop and take and, and assess mm -hmm. and figure out what, what does it mean what do you tell young women, like you, talk, you talked a moment ago about why not me, but what do you tell young women in particular who think, and I personally don't believe you can have it all at the same time, but no. you're living proof that you can have it all in a serial fashion. Right. What I tell young women, first, of, first and foremost, you have really got to know yourself. You can't let other people define who you are. You've got to not listen to those outside voices. You would be surprised how your life is really molded by all those outside voices. And we never take the time to really get to know who we are. What's our passion in life? What is it we really want to do? Who do we really want to be? What really excites us? What really gets us out of bed every morning? And I don't think that parents really listen to their own children and get to know who they really are. Because you've got to really get to know 
who your child is, and then you want to nurture the child. And that's one thing that I learned very early. And I have to say that my parents did give me that gift. They let me be me. Philanthropy. Yes. How, how does giving back work into all of this? My mother taught me that from the very beginning. I remember even in high school, we had had the football team over. My mother was always cooking for them and feeding them. And even dear Susan Sterrett, who was single at the time and always looked too thin to me, and we were always feeding her. And I mean, she was always helping neighbors. And she, was, she just had the most generous heart, almost to a fault. But she's the one that gave me the heart of generosity. And I have to tell you, the reason why I work as hard as I do and I do what I do is to be able to give back. I am thrilled to be able to help so many young people. This program that I have at Harvard at the Kennedy School for Public Leadership, at the end of five years, I'm going to have 50 extraordinary leaders that from underserved communities that are getting a full ride. They do not have to worry about health insurance, their tuition. They just need to learn, and they need to learn to be leaders. They call me Mama J. <laughs> I am there for them 24-7. I have one that was, has been completely homeless, and he put himself through school, through construction, I got him into Wharton, and now he's with me at Harvard. This is what motivates me, to be able to change lives. We need to start grooming leaders in the African-American community. I am worried. We end these conversations by asking um, our history makers to talk about their legacy, what they want to leave. You've just outlined a pretty good answer to that mm -hmm. question. Is there more to it than that? Is it about what you create when you're not here? When I leave this earth, I want people to remember me of what I've been able to give them. That the way I've been able to change lives, how I've been able to make a difference for many, many young people. And if that's the way I leave this earth, I will be very happy. Sheila Johnson, thank you. thank you. Oh, and but, we, we have another treat. We've come full circle. We've talked about achievement. We've talked about music. And now we have Kindred, the Family Soul. So honored to be here, and as one of the young people uh, who's got their first opportunity to be on television on Teen Summit, I just want to tell you thank you and dedicate this performance to you. I look in the mirror, what do I see? I see my power, my ability. I see tenderness righteousness, optimism, and a bit of fear, I guess. But no matter what I see, my eyes can tell me what I already know. I'm best as what I am, and I don't need nobody to tell me so, because I am a girl. I am a woman, I am connected to the earth and the sky, I know the secrets they only dream of, I love myself and I'm gonna tell you why, I am a girl, I am a woman, I am connected to the earth you are, so am I. Girl, you are what 
you are, so am I. Yes, you are what you are, so am I. All right, how's everybody feeling tonight? All right, we trying to get into a little something for you guys. Get everybody up, vibing, music. Come on. Yeah, it used to come. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Now you see everybody. I'm tired of broken street glass and not getting any rest unless the baby sleeps. But even then seems like we're trying to creep Tired of paying these taxes And sending emails and faxes Tired of crooked cops I'm tired of black folks complaining that crime don't stop I wanna go to a place where lovers go And do the things that lovers do No stress A sweet caress from me to you I want to do the things that we used to do Say the things we used to say Just lay around the house all day Every day, all day We get far away from here We get far away from here Far away from here Just jump in a taxi cab Pack a bag and get away fast We get far away from here We get far away from here Far away Subway trains, tired of undeserved fame, tired of watching something, watching on something. my TV doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. I'd rather be looking at you, rather be laying with you, and I don't want to forget all the love we captured the day we met, yeah. Hey. I want to go to a place where lovers go, go to a place. do the things that lovers do, do that no stuff. stress, no, a sweet caress from me to you, I want to do the things we used to do, say the things we used to say, just lay every day. Taxi cab, pack a bag and get away fast. We get far away from here, far away from here, far away from here. Just jump in a taxi cab. I need y'all to get involved, everybody out there. Come on now. Oh, yeah. Somebody say far away. Far away. Say far away. Far away. Say far away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on alive, y'all. Somebody yeah. say far away. Sing along when the hook come on right here, baby girl. We getting far away from here. We getting far away from here. Far away from here. Far away from here. Far away Just jump from in here. the taxi cab, pack a bag and get, get away fast. Far away from here. We getting far away from here. Far away from here. Just jump in the taxi cab. For Miss Johnson and that BT, we probably never would have been here singing this song for you. Yeah, we appreciate you. We thank you, sister. You've changed a lot of lives, done a lot of things that the people can see, and we're so proud to be here. We didn't far away.
For more information or to order your own copy of An Evening with Gwen Ifill, please visit thehistorymakers.org or call 866-914-1900. That's 866-914-1900. The preceding program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org.